I'm sure you'll uh, agree that our first presentation was, was wonderful. Um, we'll have to have a, a disagreement over the aesthetic nature of, uh, of mosquitoes. Um, although I, I, I also worked with them as a grad student I, in, in molecular biology. I was uh, working on infecting uh, mice with them. So I, I, I'm familiar with them, but I don't find them that pretty. Um, George Taylor, uh, no, I'm sorry, Mitch Taylor. There's too many Taylors here. We're going to have to have a couple of these removed. Um, Mitch Taylor has been uh, working on polar bears for the last uh, 30 years and was the polar bear biologist for the Northwest Territories and Nunavut Territory of Canada for more than 20 years. He's been a continuing member of the IUCN slash SSC Polar Bear Specialist Group and Canada's Federal Provincial Polar Bear Technical Committee. He's published more than 50 scientific papers on polar bear related topics and has worked in the field on most of the world's polar bear populations. Most recently, uh, Mitch assisted with field sampling, marking and recapturing the Davis Strait population, one of the most southern of all the polar bear populations, and co-authored Canada's COSAWIC polar bear draft status report. Taylor, uh, Mitch recently retired from government service and is currently based at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Canada, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Polar bears are a charismatic megafauna. Excuse me. They are the second most popular animal after elephants. I'm not sure they, where the new mosquito fits in there, but uh, and they symbolize the pristine character of Arctic latitudes. Polar bears have also become an icon to focus world attention on environmental damage from anthropogenic carbon dioxide caused climate warming. And polar bears have been likened to the canary in the coal mine as a species whose sensitivity to environmental degradation can serve as a warning to man of the impending dire consequences from climate warming. Polar bears have been recommended as a, for listing as a threatened with extinction species under the Endangered Species Act by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. A recent article by the senior polar bear biologist for the USGS suggests that 70 percent of the species could be lost in the next 40 years. However, the current demographic data and the projected reductions in ice from the IPCC climate models do not support the perspective that polar bears are threatened with extinction at the present time or in the foreseeable future. So let's start with what everybody knows. The polar bear, uh, these are just a couple of takes off websites, um, usually arranged with a polar bear either on a single ice flow or staring out to sea in an open water situation. Center for Biological Diversity on their website states the polar bear is at risk of extinction as global warming melts away its Arctic sea ice habitat. I can't hear you. I oh, sorry. Put it like this, maybe. Uh, now it's getting a second chance. Polar bears may get protection under the Endangered Species Act, but that decision is not final. On the World Wildlife website, they state in some areas of their Arctic home, polar bears are in decline. Their drop in population can be traced to another decline, that of sea ice, reduced by global warming. Sea ice is the polar bear's primary habitat. They rely on it for survival unless major actions are taken to reduce global warming. Uh, Two-thirds of the world's polar bears are likely to be gone by 2050. And this has become just generally accepted. If you talk to someone on the street or, or uh, a reporter, uh, it's almost assumed that this is just occurring. It's a scientific uh, result. Um, there we go. However, the suggestion that polar bear numbers are rapidly declining at the present time or that scientific research has demonstrated that they'll uh, be eliminated from much of the range or become extinct is not supported either by current information or by the forecast changes in ice. To start with, uh, you, polar bears don't exist as one big homogeneous population spread throughout the whole circumpolar basin. They stay in relatively uh, uh, discrete areas we call subpopulations. The Arctic Basin is identified as a subpopulation, but it has no population of its own, only transient bears that move through there and back to their sort of original population. Each of these has its own ecological and, and sort of climatological uh, uh, sort of situation, circumstances. And so the response of each of these populations to a, a given thing like uh, climate warming would not be expected to occur simultaneously or even the same in different areas. But mostly when it's represented, it's just a sheet of ice and it's one big population of polar bears and bad things are happening. So as far as, as, far as I'm aware, no one's really disputing that, that there's been a decline in sea ice over about the last 20 years. And that's not that's independent of observations of what's driving climate change or, or where it's going from now. 
But for sure there's been a decline in ice, that's just an observation. And this decline in ice has had impacts on polar bear populations. Uh, this uh, graph, I'm sure you've seen it reproduced many times, the, the actual decline in ice is the red solid line. There's a median line, which is the mean of all these various climate model projections. The two lines on the outside are the standard errors. So I'd like to talk first about some of the anecdotal information that's used to sort of say, oh, well, these bad things are happening, and it kind of helps tear the story as well. So one of the things that's often said is that uh, polar bears are uh, uh, now forced on shore. Uh, the duration of the open water season has increased. And because they're on shore and because they're starving, they're forced uh, into contact with man. They're scavenging at dumps, and uh, this is causing human bear conflicts and uh, sort of evidence that polar bears are uh, uh, nutritionally stressed. Um, here's the proof, except that this picture was taken in the early 1980s when polar bears were weaning cubs uh, as sub-adults, essentially, and some cubs were weaned as yearlings, which wasn't happening in any other population. And if you look at those bears, you'll see that they're they're extremely good condition. They're not suffering from nutritional stress at all. But if you looked at it and you heard the explanation, you might think there was something to it. Another thing is that as polar bears are onshore for longer and longer periods, and as the ice becomes less and less consolidated, they'll have difficulty feeding. And look, we've seen a skinny bear. And yeah, bears die. This, this bear starved to death. It's an old bear. It starved to death in the spring during a period of maximum ice coverage. It wasn't due to, to climate change at all. It lost its life at the at that time when the ice coverage was was the, the strongest in that particular area, which was Davis Strait. There, there's about 24,500 polar bears uh, in the circumpolar basin. With survival estimates, we know that about 1,500 die a year because of natural mortality. Observing natural mortality is not evidence or proof that the population is declining or going extinct. Death is as common as birth in natural populations. Another bit of evidence that come out is that polar bears, because now they're, they have the time on shore is longer and they're in closer proximity, there's more cannibalism. What you're seeing here, the, the, the bear in the, in the background, is a large adult male. It attacked and killed a cub, and as you can see, it's consumed part of the cub. But if you look carefully, like neither the cub which is a yearling cub, or the adult male is in poor condition. You can't see the female. She's lying on a hill overlooking this scene. I, I tagged her too, I immobilized her. The male isn't dead, by the way, he's just immobilized. So essentially all three bears were in good condition. Again, intraspecific attacks occur. Uh, they occur not frequently. The bears usually segregate themselves spatially to minimize a thing like that. But local people, hunters, uh, report this as common in all polar bear populations. The fact that it's been observed by a few people you know, on sea ice or in areas where they think polar bears are impacted does not demonstrate a change at all. It's just an observation of something that's part of the natural history of polar bears. Polar bears are now sort of onshore and they're now thought to be hungry and that's forcing them into conflicts with man. And, and again, this would sort of seem to demonstrate that, but this is just a a guy who's looking for the bear, actually, he's leading a group of tourists who are walking around to look out bears, and the polar bear obviously has him in view. He doesn't have the polar bear in view, but there was no predation attempt there. The bear's just sort of sizing him up, trying to figure out the best way to get away from the person behind that's taking the picture, and this guy who now has him sort of trapped in between each other. And it hasn't quite gotten this ridiculous yet, but you could use something like this to argue that polar bears are evolving into kind of a hell bear so that they can feed exclusively on man, or that this bear was so nutritionally stressed that it ate its own nose. I mean, it probably lost its nose in a trap as a cub, right? But these anecdotal sort of things that you see in the press all the time, they prove nothing. They're not, they're not evidence for population trend. So essentially, most polar bears uh, uh, in most populations appear, at least from a demographic perspective, to be in fairly good condition. And I'll talk a little bit about that right now. The way that we actually do population assessments is not sort of just go out and kind of fly around and see what we see the bears are doing and come back and come up with a story. It's actually quite a bit more work than that. One year of a mark recapture study would cost between half a million, 700,000 dollars. 
And this is just a, I don't have time to go into a lot of the details of how this is all done, but we involve local people in the work. Most of the work is done by helicopter. It's a mark recapture sort of program. We're analyzing it with uh, uh, programs that are developed by biometricians around the world. Uh, Colorado State is one of the leading groups. It's put through simulation models to, to make our projections that are quantitative and data-based. And often we're on the shore, uh, not often, but sometimes we're able to do ground-based work with local people as well. And the way that work occurs is we fly until we uh, uh, see a bear, uh, dart the bear. Uh, that's my colleague Lily Peacock from Nunavut uh, darting that one. Um, when the bear's down, we'll put ear tags in, put lip tattoos, take samples for genetics, uh, carbon nitrogen analysis, sometimes blood for nutritional work, some hair for heavy metal analysis, take measures so that we can look at the nutritional state of the bears. But our perspectives are not, are not as, as we heard about earlier, the demographic perspectives that we develop are not based on conjecture or climate models. They're based on, on data. It's science. It's, it's sort of estimating the uncertainty of these measures as a part of the uncertainty of our projections. These data have identified two populations that are currently in trouble. And uh, that's the Western Hudson Bay population, sometimes called the Churchill population. That's the most southern one in Canada. And the Southern Beaufort Sea population, which is the one that's off the North Shore of Alaska, also shared with Canada. Neither population appears to be viable. And by that, I mean that it would decline even if there was no harvest at the present time. In the South, uh, uh, Dr. Sterling with Canadian Wildlife Service has got convincing data that it has been caused by this gradual and progressive reduction in ice that that's caused the bear uh, recruitment and survival rates to decline to the point where, you know, the increase in natural mortality uh, coupled with a harvest that's no longer sustained has caused that population to decline. They weren't able to identify a numerical decline in the southern Beaufort Sea, but they were able to show that the life history parameters, rates of birth and death, are no longer sufficient for that population to increase. Most of the, uh, of the uh, literature, most of the proof, most of what's written uh, about the circumpolar situation comes from these two populations. But these are not the only two populations. There are two others that are also declining. Uh, that's in the Polar Bear Specialist Group report. Kane Basin and Baffin Bay, both are declining because they're overhunted. It has nothing to do with climate change. It's a demographic result. So we have two that are declining, probably from climate change, two that are declining from overhunting. Um, the guys will give us an argument about Baffin Bay, the hunters, they don't feel that it's declining, but from our data, from our science, we think that the bears are probably being reduced in that area. But both those populations are viable. Both could sustain the harvest if it was just reduced to uh, sustainable limits. This table, uh, and I've got a, a a sort of a, a website where you can get all of this in, in sort of more explained form, is essentially the information that we draw on to develop a demographic perspective on status. And I, you can see there are only two boxes that are highlighted, Western Hudson Bay and Southern Beaufort Sea, where the populations are non-viable. I don't have time to go sort of in through the table and talk about the different cells and population growth rates, but we're using population viability analysis, database population projections. Most of the populations, which have data have been collected over the past 20 years during the uh, reduction in ice during the time when the climate has gotten generally warmer. Most of these populations have, have not, if they have had a, a reduction in, uh, in their uh, productivity and in their ability to sustain a harvest, what remained was still sufficient that we could have a fairly substantial harvest, in fact, a harvest at approximately historical levels. So that perspective has been criticized, and that's how it used to be. But people are saying, now it's different. Now we've had climate change, and now some of these populations are, uh, you know, declining. And, you know, just because you haven't seen it in the older work doesn't mean it's not happening now. That's a valid point. So let's look just at six studies that have been completed since 2004. I mentioned the top two already, the Southern Beaufort and the Western Hudson population. It looks like those populations are in decline. The Northern Beaufort and Southern Hudson populations, which are adjacent to those two, appear to be constant again, from the same kind of mark recapture studies I've shown, and the Davis Strait and uh, uh, Barents Sea populations appear to have increased. And again, 
just to show on the map, the Davis Strait and Barron Strait populations uh, have increased from historical levels. Current trend is unknown. We're just completing a study in Davis Strait. And the Barrett Sea was done by uh, uh, aerial surveys, so we won't have the birth and death rates we need to sort of project a trend from those populations. But at least from the last 20 years, an increase for Barrett Strait, Davis Strait, decline for Southern Beaufort, Western Hudson, and no change for Northern Beaufort, Southern Hudson. Now, this is, this is not a scenario where the bears are declining to extinction. So where is that coming from? Well, it's coming, as, as Scott stated earlier, it's coming entirely from the climate change models that say the ice will continue to deteriorate and that the things we've seen in the southern Beaufort and western Hudson will occur in these other populations. Well, let's examine that. And again, I'm not, th these are not from my work. Uh, these are from a paper by uh, uh, Dr. Steve Amstrup with USGS. He's identified four types of ice and said that the way the ice will decline won't be the same in all areas, which is true. He's got divergent ice, where prevailing winds and currents move it out of the area, convergent ice, which benefit from that by receiving the, the ice that's pushed around, seasonal populations, which have always had an open water season, and archipelago populations, which basically have summer sea ice and, and every year. And if you take the climate models, which they have done, and you project forward what will happen with sea ice from 2004, which is the polar bear specialist group status report where we get our population estimates from. So 2004 is the baseline for these four, and I see the, the new PowerPoints messed up the top, but for the four archipelago seasonal divergent and, and convergent ice, you'll see, and if you just look at the all column, you'll see that about in a, in a hundred years, we're looking at a reduction of the ice that's greater than 50 percent over continental shelf waters that the reduction will be about 32 percent. And if we apply that, as Amstrup suggests is reasonable, uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis to the number of polar bears, we'd expect to see a reduction in the total populations from about 24,500 down to about 17,180 over the next 100 years. Over the next 40 years, we would only expect to see a reduction to, say, uh, 2,405, which looks like about, what would that be, about an 18 percent reduction. It's a bit easier to see on the graph, but yes, if the climate change models are right, we're going to see a decline in sea ice. And that's what these graphs are saying. And if we have the decline in sea ice, you might notice on this one it doesn't go to zero here. It just goes to 0 0.6. If you notice on the other one, which does go to zero, that it, will re it, it could be expected to reduce polar bear populations, but not cause them to go extinct or even be eliminated from, from a large part of their range, but simply to cause a decline of about of about 30 percent over a 100-year time frame. Given all the uncertainty about climate change model projections, and given the fact that most populations are, are stationary or increasing as far as we know from the science that's been done, it's hard for me to understand why people think polar bears are going extinct. So as my, uh, my friend at McGill often says, no sweat in the Arctic, that uh, we, don't, we don't appear to be any imminent danger of losing these populations. However, it is important that we uh, uh, identify sound conservation practices and that of these practices, increased monitoring, uh, including uh, uh, continued work on, on climate change, um, looking at how polar bears will adapt to changes in ice, how these open ocean populations may shift to uh, uh, an open water season, where like the seasonal populations, they summer onshore. Um, there's a lot of work that could be done to understand the implications of the loss in sea ice. But we have time, and uh, we certainly have the expertise to do that. And again, I'd like to thank the Heartland Institute for uh, hosting this conference and Science and Public Policy Institute for supporting this work. Thank you.